Welcome to Essential English. Your journey to English mastery starts here. Whether you're a beginner or looking to level up your language skills, we've got you covered. Our channel is packed with engaging content that will make learning English a breeze. From grammar tips to vocabulary boosters, we've got it all. So grab your pens and get ready to dive into a world of words. Explore the pages of our virtual library where books come to life and knowledge awaits. Let our animated globes take you on a linguistic adventure around the world, discovering new cultures and expanding your horizons. Join our community of language enthusiasts and embark on a journey that will transform your English skills. So what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button and let's start this exciting journey together. Essential English, your passport to fluency. Let's get started. Lesson 15, The Story of Hob. A letter from the author of this book to a teacher in Greece. Longmans. Green and C.O. Limited. 48 Grosvenor Street. London. W.I. The 18th of January 19. Dear Miss. I was very pleased to receive your letter and to hear of the work you had been doing with Essential. English. And so your students have been asking questions about Hob. They have been asking what is his nationality why he should be learning English, etc., etc., so, too, have quite a lot of other people. The problem about Hob was not an easy one. You see, in these books I could teach all the favorable adjectives easily enough. Lucille could be beautiful, gay and well-dressed. Frida could be charming. Olaf could be clean and manly. Pedro could be the handsome, well-traveled man of the world. Jan could be clever and hard-working and attractive. And no Poles or Frenchmen or Swedes would rise up in anger against me. But how could I teach the opposites? Of these? Whoever knew a Pole, Frenchman, Swiss, Swede, or South American who was lazy, badly dressed, careless, untidy? What storms I should have brought on my head if a character of any recognizable nationality had all these bad qualities. It was then that I thought of Hob. He, like all my characters, had been a student in one of my classes. I knew his story though I didn't want to tell it just then. However, I can do so now without hurting anyone. The story goes back many years now to the Lancashire town of Manchester. In a little house there, in a small street, South Bank Street, lived the Hobdell family. It was a large family, but the only ones I knew were Eliza and Berta, Ben and Albert and Irene, Theophilus, Tom and Aggie I never met, Albert, familiar to readers of essential English as Uncle Albert, was a fine-looking fellow, six foot two in height, broad-shouldered and strong as a horse. He was no scholar, he couldn't even write his own name. He was, as he himself said, no credit to his teachers. But he was shrewd and sharp-witted and the merriest, liveliest and most warm-hearted companion you could wish for. Many are the Lancashire hot pots and many the plates of fish and chips I've. 1. See Recollections and Adventures. Page 62. 2. See Essential English. Book 1. Page 204. 3. See Essential English Book 3. Pages 137 to 141. 4. See Essential English Book 3. Pages 151 to 5. 5. See Essential English Book 2. Pages 40 to 42. 6. Hot pot equals a Lancashire dish made with meat, potatoes and onions cooked slowly. Eaten in South Bank Street. And many are the stories with which Albert kept us all roaring with laughter. But it's not Albert so much as Irene that my story is chiefly concerned with. Irene was the youngest of the family. She was about 20 when I first knew her. Gay, laughing, full of life and high spirits. She had Albert's nature, and the prettiest girl in Manchester. She was, I'm afraid, a sore trial to Eliza. The oldest of the family. A sour-faced woman of 40-odd. Eliza had always been full of don'ts and mustn'ts. Ben. Don't eat so much. Albert. Don't laugh like that. Albert said that when he was a boy. 
She used to say, Albert, go and see what Irene's doing. And tell her she mustn't. Now, it was, Irene, you mustn't wear that short dress. It's not proper. Poor Eliza saw impropriety everywhere. She even, so Albert told me, put cotton trousers on the legs of the piano because she thought bare legs were improper. She was about as cheerful as a wet Sunday afternoon in Manchester. Which is saying a lot. But her sourness seemed to have no effect on Irene. Nor for that matter on Albert and Ben. They just laughed and made a joke of it all. Eliza and Berta, who was even sourer but less talkative than Eliza, thought Irene ought to stay at home in the evenings sewing or knitting. Irene preferred going out with soldiers. This was during the war. To knitting socks for them. And there were always plenty of soldiers coming to South Bank Street to take Irene out. Amongst them, and her chief favorite, was Ruperto. What his other name was I never knew. Everyone just called him Ruperto. He had come to England with our allies, the Ruritanian forces. He was a corporal, I think, or perhaps a sergeant, a gay, dashing sort of fellow with dark, romantic-looking eyes and black curly hair. He didn't speak much English. But that seemed to be no obstacle to his popularity with the girls of Manchester. And it was soon quite clear that Irene had eyes for no one except Ruperto. The end of the war came and he went back home to Ruritania. Quite honestly, despite the fact that Irene lost a lot of her gaiety, most of us hoped that we had seen the last of him. But a month or two later Irene got a letter from Ruritania in hardly understandable English, asking her to come to Ruritania and marry him. Albert looked more solemn about it than I have ever seen him look about anything. He had no high opinion of Ruperto. Neither had I, but it was none of my business. So I said nothing. Eliza, of course, hated the thought of Irene marrying anyone, and was horrified at the thought of her marrying a foreigner. But Irene had no doubts. All her old gaiety came back at once. She was overflowing with happiness and laughed and sang about the house all day. She drew all her savings out of the bank. Bought herself pretty clothes. Bought things for her new home. Presents for Ruperto. And set off in high spirits for Ruritania. A month or two later we had a letter from her. She was married to Ruperto and they had a little home about 10 miles from Stralsaw. Just on the borders of Ruritania and the Urbanian Republic. They were very happy and everything was wonderful. I left Lancashire soon after that and took a job in Scotland. And later moved to London. Albert stayed in Lancashire and I lost touch with him. As I told you, he couldn't write and it was no use my writing letters that he couldn't read. Years went by, I married, and had more or less forgotten about the Hobdels. Then one day my secretary came to tell me that a visitor, a Mr. Hobdell, had called to see me. Hobdell, Albert, Irene. I went to the entrance hall and there was Albert. Older, fatter, prosperous looking, but the same old Albert. I think he was as pleased to see me as I was to see him. I had finished work for the day and we went to a quiet little tea room nearby to have a good talk. And to get all his news. Yes. Albert. Had done very well. He was making a fortune. Eliza? Yes. She had a little house of her own. She had softened with the passage of time. But the piano legs still had cotton trousers on them. And Irene? I said. Albert's face lost all its smiles. It was as if you had turned off a light inside him. Irene's dead, he said. As a matter of fact that's one reason why I've come to see you. I was shocked to hear it. I remembered her so full of life and laughter and happiness. And all that was gone. Yes, he went on. It was a bad business. You know I never liked that fellow Ruperto that she married. He left her a year or two after her boy was born. Hob. He's called. Irene never told us about Ruperto leaving her. For a time she wrote a letter home fairly often. They were just short letters saying she was getting on all right. 
Then the letters came less and less often. Then it was just a card at Christmas time. And then they stopped altogether. Eliza and Ben wrote to her. You know I'm no scholar. But the letters were returned, address not known. We were all very upset about it. For Eliza in spite of her sharp tongue was really fond of Irene. But there seemed to be nothing we could do. Then about six months ago there came a brief note from her saying she was very ill and asking me to come and see her if I could. I took a plane to Strelsaw the very next day. She was lying in a bed in a poor little room. Bare and comfortless. I could have cried to see how thin in. 1. For the story of Albert see pages 92 to 100. Pale and old she looked. But when she saw me she tried to smile as she used to in the old days at home. I'd have given all I have if I could have taken her home with me to Lancashire and brought back her. Rosie checks and smiles. But she knew. And I knew. That it was too late. Albert, she said. I wanted to see you about Hob. He'll be all alone when I'm gone. You need have no worry about him. My dear, I interrupted. He'll come back to England with me and I'll do all I can for him. Tears came into her eyes. I knew you would. Albert, she said. Two days later she died. Hobbs been living with me for six months now. And I want some help from you. I want to do the best I can for the lad. He's a bit of a problem. He's lazy. Untidy and not too particular about being clean. That's from his father. But he's warm-hearted good-humored and loves a joke. I know where that's from, I said. Albert laughed. I like Hob. He's a fellow after my own heart and I think he'll do all right in the end. And what is it you want me to do? I said. You can count on me to do anything I can. Well, said Albert slowly. You see when Hob came here he spoke English with a sort of horrible Ruritanian accent. He's lived with me for six months and now they say he's speaking it with a terrible Lancashire accent. I must say I don't notice it myself. But then, as you know, I'm not a gentleman. Can you tell me where I can get a good teacher who can teach Hob to speak English as it ought to be spoken? That's why I called to see you today. I can certainly help you there, I said. And nothing would give me more pleasure. I know a Mr. Priestley who gives English lessons to foreign students. But Hobbes not a foreign student exactly. He's only half foreign. And that's the half that Mr. Priestley will deal with, I said. Moreover, Mr. Priestley is quite a good phonetician and he'll soon deal with Hobbes' Lancashire accent. And he's really good? Said Albert. It's not a matter of money. I'm willing to pay for the best. In my opinion, I said. Charles Priestley is the best teacher in England. Fine, said Albert. The best is good enough for me. And for Hob. And that's how Hob became one of Mr. Priestley's pupils. All good wishes. Yours sincerely. C. E. Eckersley. P.S. I realize that this story doesn't agree with Hob's own account of his coming to England. Book 3. Pages. 2-5. But what I have told you is the true story. Hob is shrewd like Albert. He doesn't tell you more than he wants you to know. He loves to tell a story. Not necessarily true by any means. Even when, as in book 2, page 40, he tells you it's a true one. Verb study. 12. Say and tell. The meaning of say and tell is roughly the same. But the grammatical construction used with each is different. And each verb has special idiomatic uses. The patterns with tell are. 1. Tell plus a direct object. I.e. Tell something. E.g. He can tell the time. Will you tell us the story about the fire of London? But more frequently it is. 2. Tell plus indirect object plus direct object. I.e. Tell somebody something. E.g. Subject. Verb. Indirect object. Direct object. Tell me a story. The truth. Your name. I told Hob what to do. He told us that he was going away. I told the gardener to cut the grass. The patterns with say are. 1. Say something. E.g. Every night the child says her prayers. 
He said, I am very busy. He said that he was very busy. 2. Say something to somebody. E.g. He said, good morning, to me. I said to the gardener. Cut the grass. Compare with. I told the gardener to cut the grass. When I see him I shall say to him. What have you done with my money? Quote. Note. 1. Say is used when we are reporting the actual words spoken. Tell is never used with the actual words spoken. 2. With say the person spoken to need not be mentioned. With told the person spoken to must be mentioned. E.g. The teacher said. Do all the exercises. The teacher told the class to do all the exercises. 3. In reported speech say is followed by a noun clause. Not. As told can be. By the infinitive. Compare. I said that he must leave the house. I told him to leave the house. Verb study. 13. Go. In lesson 15 you will find several expressions with go. Went. Gone. In them. E.g. The story goes back many years now. Go and see what Irene's doing. Irene preferred going out with soldiers. He went back to Ruritania. Years went by. Yes. He went on. Equals continued. It was a bad business. He'll be all alone when I'm gone. Equals dead. Here are a few other common usages. My watch kept going slow. Now it won't go at all. How did the concert go? Quote. Equals was it successful? It went. Or went down. Very well. The apples have gone bad. I think it is going to rain. I'm going in for my examination in July. The fire has gone out. It is love that makes the world go round. Proverb. Exercises. 1. Word study. Use the following. Lively. Use also liveliness. To liven up. Companion. Use also company. Chips. Roar. Most English people pronounce this like raw. Raw. Proper. Note also improper. Impropriety. Talkative. Knit. Romantic. Use also romance. Obstacle. Solemn. Horrified. Use also horror. Horrible. Horribly. Overflowing. Border. Secretary. Prosperous. Use also prosperity. Nation. Use also nationality. Note the difference in accentuation. Recognizable. Use also recognize and recognition. Note accentuation. Good humored. 2. Explain the following words or phrases. 1. A dozen or so. 2. He's a bit of a problem. 3. I'm no scholar. 4. I would do my utmost. 5. Pedro was a well-traveled man of the world. 6. No one would rise up in anger. 7. The story goes back many years now. 8. He was sharp-witted. 9. Albert kept us roaring with laughter. 10. Irene was a sore trial to Eliza. A sour-faced woman of 40-odd. 11. Irene had eyes for no one except Ruperto. 12. We hope we had seen the last of him. 13. In hardly understandable English. 14. He had no high opinion of Ruperto. 15. Albert stayed in Lancashire and I lost touch with him. 16. It was a bad business. 17. We were all very upset about it. 18. Hob is a fellow after my own heart. 19. You can count on me. 20. It's not a matter of money. 3. In the story you had the expressions. Albert was broad-shouldered and warm-hearted. Give similar compound adjectives to describe. A. Persons who have. Blue eyes. Red cheeks. Brown hair. A dark skin. A long nose. Big bones. Long legs. Flat feet. Traveled a lot. B. A person whose. Spirits are high. Whose heart is warm. Whose tongue is sharp. Whose wits are quick. Whose will is strong. Whose temper is hot. C. A man who has neither beard nor mustache. A suit made by a good tailor. A book whose binding is made of leather. 4. Use the following in sentences of your own. 1. Go out. 2. Go in for. 3. Go down. 4. Go on. 5. 
go with, 6, go out with, 7, go by, 8, go about it, 9, on the go, 10, go down, 11, go over, 12, it goes to show, 5, use the following in sentences of your own, a, it goes without saying, that is to say, what do you say to, to say one's say, a saying, they say, b, tell the truth, tell their own tale, telling, to tell on someone, all told, 6, make sentences using the word tell with the meanings, a, to express or show, b, to discover, c, to order, d, to have an effect, 7, rewrite the following sentences using tell instead of say, 1, Eliza said to Albert, go and see what Irene's doing, 2, Pedro said to Lucille, you sing very well, 3, I said to him, open the door, 4, she said to me, I am sorry I can't speak English better, 5, Eliza said, Albert don't laugh like that, 6, he said to me that he was very busy, 7, you had better say to George what you have said to me, 8, I said to the gardener that he must cut the grass, 9, he said to me, I have lost your money, 10, Mr. Priestley said to his students, there will be a holiday tomorrow, 8, composition exercises, 1, write a composition or short story having for its title one of the following, a, tales our mothers told us, b, the boy who couldn't tell a lie, c, some old sayings in your language and what they mean, 2, what qualities would you expect from, a, a good doctor, b, a businessman, c, a nurse, d, a lawyer, write a character sketch of each of these, 3, tell in about 300 to 400 words the story of Hob, 4, invent a short story in which the chief character is Uncle Ben, or Aunt Eliza, or Aunt Aggie, or Uncle Theophilus, 5, write a short account of some person, real or imaginary, that you have known. Thank you for joining us on Essential English. We hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Remember, learning English can be fun and exciting, just like our little friend here. Don't miss out on more engaging English lessons by subscribing to our channel and hitting the bell icon. Stay connected with us and join us next time on Essential English. Together, let's unlock the world of language.